Good morning, Christ United Methodist Church. Welcome if you are here live. Welcome if you are tuning in by cable or by internet. So this is kind of interesting. Sam and I got to sleep in this morning. Isn't that nice, Sam? I actually, this, the sun was up when I got up. It, that doesn't happen much on Sunday. Doesn't happen yeah. much. And it was so much warmer than last Sunday at 6.30 in the cemetery where it was snowing and blowing and we bought froze. So, hey, welcome to worship. We got a lot planned today. This is the day we're celebrating our 150th anniversary, 152 years after the church began. That's a long story. We'll explain it later. Um, one note for your bulletin order of service, if you have one, Marianne Cornetti is with us, but she is not able to sing today. She is struggling with ulcerative laryngitis. So she will talk to you, but she cannot sing. So we'll introduce her at that spot in the service. Other than that, um, I know there are two things I need to remind you of. I'm going to do them out of this gate so I don't forget. One is, in your bulletin, there is a piece called Blanket the World with Love. An opportunity for you to give a blanket to a third world country, people in need, people in crisis, in honor or in memory of a mom for Mother's Day. So take a peek at that. The other thing is, I would remiss if I didn't say you all are staying after church for a few minutes because if any of that food in Heritage Hall is left, Ann Bocker will have my head. <laughs> it looks like a wedding reception in there. I'm not lying. There is all kind of history stuff in there for you to look at, pictures, all kind of things. So take some time after church and go in and um, peruse some of the history, ask some questions. Reverend Holstey is here. Some of you are going to want to go torment Dave and say hi to him. So welcome, Holsties. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Um, it's a good morning to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen? All right. Let's open with a word of prayer, and we'll kick off with some singing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these moments, moments when we can step into your presence, lift our voices and thank you and praise you for who you are and what you've done. May these moments of worship transform us, that we may look a little more like Jesus when we leave here. Guide us, direct us as we celebrate, as we worship, as we learn, as we grow. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. Welcome to worship. Good morning. This is not a day to be slackers. Do you understand what I mean? We're going to celebrate. We're going to honor those that have made this day possible, and we're going to give glory to God. So let us stand and let us do that with our voices today. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us out, choir. Strong now. The church's one foundation.
I think it's so wonderful when we all gather in one setting to proclaim our faith, who we are, what we believe. So let us join together as we proclaim our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. shake a hand and express the joy to one another of being with them today in the family of God. I'm so glad. Let us worship him now. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name.
today. Lord, of all we do today, Lord, we want to honor those who worked hard through the generations so that we could be here worshiping freely in this place. Above all, God, we give glory to you, for you are worthy of our praise, and all that we have has come from you. So, Lord, (laughs) we worship your holy name. And, God, with our hearts or with our voices, with our bodies, with our souls, we shout to you these words of praise. Thank you, Jesus. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Another hour and a half, I think, yeah. we'd be good. Hey, any kids want to come up front for children's sermon? Hi, guys. All right. All right, I got two objects in my hand, and I'm going to ask you questions, and you tell me which one to use. You ready? I want to send an email. Which one do I use, my Bible or my iPad? My iPad. I want to send a text message, Bible or iPad? iPad. I want to read God's Word, Bible or iPad? Wrong, I can use either one. (laughs) Did you know that? I have on my iPad, I mean, there it is, hold on, I have the Bible on my iPad. It doesn't look anything like this, does it? But there it is. So which one is God's Word, the Bible on my iPad or the Bible in my Bible? That's a tough question, huh? Both, exactly, both. You see, some things never change. God's word in scripture is always the same. When I was younger, this is what I used. You can see because it's kind of well-worn, right? But as I got older, they developed this really cool thing called an iPad. And my iPad has my Bible on it. So no matter where I am, I've got my Bible with me. I don't have to remember to grab the book and take, I have it with me. It's even on, you ready for this? Hold on to your socks. It's on my phone. Dude, how cool is that? And it's all the Bible. So, you know, if like you're going on a trip or something and you're kind of bored and you can read and you forget your Bible at home, ask your parents for their phone. See? And you can read it from their phone. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here's the problem. Your parents have to download the app first. So today when you get home, remind them to put the app on their phone that has the Bible so that when you ask for it, it's there. Is that a good deal? Okay. Let me pray with you, and then I have, um, huh. I find lollipops. Isn't that amazing? The things you find behind lilies. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that your word is always, always the same. And it's available to us in so many forms. Lord, help us to engage with your word often. Whether we're reading it out of a book or reading it off of an iPad or reading it off of a phone, Lord, help us to remember to read it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, how about a lollipop? And then you guys, if you want, you can hang out with moms and dads in the sanctuary or you can go back with Miss Amy to children's ministry. It's your call. I know, it's a tough call. You just pick one. Like, they're all good, trust me. I've tasted every one that's in it. Not every one of those. Like, I didn't lick them first. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Bobby. All right. Let me share with you some prayer concerns this morning as we spend a moment in prayer. Elizabeth Johnson um, has several family members that have been struggling, but she's also on the road traveling, and she could use our our prayer and our support as she does that. Cindy McGill got home from the hospital after her recent surgery. She is still healing. Be praying for her. Lou Ann Hart and Carol Rue's mom, Maxine Foster, passed away early Friday morning, so we want to pray for those families. And Lori Schweitzer's dad, Bob Doherty, passed away Saturday morning, so be praying for Lori and her family as they make arrangements to lay dad to rest. Tomorrow, our Ann Bocker, who is working diligently to make sure we all have something good to eat this morning, um, is headed in for her second knee replacement, other knee, not the same one. So be praying for Ann, be praying for the doctors and nurses, all right? So she'll be laid up for a few weeks. Um, we'll be contacting her electronically till then, till she's back on her feet, but be praying for her. 
And let's remember Nate Greenway. Nate um, hurt his foot. Dropped an 1,100-pound piece of steel on it. So be praying for Nate. I took a chance, i got to tell you, Rachel, because I texted him and said, am I allowed to pray for you in church out loud? And he didn't respond, so tell him I tried. <laughs> when you get a text from the pastor, especially Sunday morning, answer it. It's <laughs> the way that works. Let's also remember Mary Ann as she is healing up and her voice is healing up. And we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, in your own special way, you reach into each one of our lives and make your presence known. And we are so grateful for that. Father, there are some days that if it wasn't for you, we don't know how the heck we'd even make it through the day, much less the week. We thank you that your Holy Spirit resides in us and that you touch us every day. Remind us that there is nothing that we encounter that's a surprise to you. Remind us, Father, that you're with us every moment, every breath. Carrying, supporting, encouraging. This morning, Father, we've mentioned just a handful of names. But the list is quite long. For I would dare say, Father, that everyone within the sound of my voice as a blessing they could celebrate and a need they could lift up. So, Father, in this moment, we say thank you for what is on our heart. And, Father, in this moment, we ask your presence in the situation that's on our mind. Father, we, we do thank you for all that have gone on before us, for the shoulders of so many upon whom we stand as a congregation, and we individually stand as fellow believers. The moms, the dads, the aunts, the uncles, the Sunday school teachers, the babysitters, the neighbors who shared with us their faith and allowed us to see you for the first time. Those folks who have gone on before, Father, who laid out a path in front of us to follow, a path of loving you, God, a path of loving others, a path of making disciples. Lord, we so desperately want to be your people. We so desperately want to have an impact, not just here in Franklin, not just in western Pennsylvania, but across the globe. Father, show us how. Continue to guide us and direct us for another 150 years that we could be a light shining in the darkness. Father, now continue to empower our worship. Open your word to us that we may hear it again, perhaps for the first time. Move, call, transform, Father. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ, and we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Marianne, if you'll step up here just a sec, I want to introduce you to the congregation. We, actually, we can do it down here. It might be easier. And Nick's got you mic'd. So, Marianne and I go back um, just a couple of years because we only graduated high school five, six years ago, we're going to claim. You better go to confession. <laughs> A little longer than that. Yeah. 1981, we graduated together from Knock High School in Saxonburg. Prior to that, my job was to document all the things that Marianne was in, all the plays, all that kind of stuff, because I was school photographer. And um, I was really calm like this then. <laughs> um, but, Nothing's changed. Yeah. <laughs> But Marianne said to me here a couple years ago, in fact, it was the fall of, um, fall of 19, we come down, Sharon and I come down and saw you and Hansel and Gretel at the Benendum. 18. 18. And she said, um, hey, I want to come to Franklin and sing. I said, Marianne, I love you, but we can't afford you. <laughs> and she said, no, 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 I want to give back to your community. So I'll come sing, you find a place that needs funding, and we'll do this. So we picked the music program at Franklin High School, and Mary Ann is going to come on May 6th to sing for us. I've asked her to come up, one, to say hi. So this is Mary Cornetti. This are all my friends. <laughs> I've asked her to tell us one thing, a place that God has shown up big or a weird place you've gotten a chance to sing. What do you want to share with us? Well, first of all, let me just say... It is such a pleasure to be here this morning. I can't tell you how blessed I feel being in this congregation. Methodists, and my grandmother and mother all grew up with Methodists, they know how to sing. <laughs> and it's awesome. Yeah, it is. And I feel so blessed yeah. to have that feeling of just the love of God around us. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's just so wonderful. And of course, for the momentous occasion of the 150th anniversary of this church, yeah. again, I'm blessed and honored to be a part of it. I'm very sorry, as you can hear, still a little bit rough. I've had really a horrible bronchitis for the last three weeks. It was rough, but we're on the mend, and that, that's really good. And lastly, but not leastly, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been a while. To see my dear friend <laughs> in his element. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. There are things that we remember from high school, there are things that we don't change. Personalities really don't change, but our paths change. Oh, yeah. And to see you mm. in this church, which is so alive, yeah. where so many churches are not quite so alive, yeah. it is so awesome. Is. And so I'm just thrilled, ah, Daryl. I mean that very sincerely. Thank you. Now, as I'm coming through the door, he says, Marianne, could you, you know, <laughs> give uh, you know, some little story about somewhere along the line in your career where God has said, and I'm thinking, oh, great, Daryl, we have like three minutes here. And so, but I do have, I've had 33 years of an amazing career, still going. Little hiccup with the, uh, the pandemic, but that's all right, we're still going. It was in 2015, and I had the great opportunity to sing with Opera Tel Aviv. Mm. But this was their summer festival, and they had this wonderful festival that they put, it was only the second season that they were doing this. They went to um, the, uh, um, oh my gosh, the base of Mount Masada. Mm -hmm. In the desert, they would dig out this place for a theater, a 10,000 seat theater. The base of Mount Masada. Here was Mount Masada, the desert, and the Dead Seas right there. And I had the great opportunity to sing Aida. This is one of the roles that I have sung over 300 performances. 
So in the middle of the desert, you know, there are all kind of things that go on and, and we were rehearsing and we would start to rehearse about 10, 15 at night because it was so hot in the desert. So this was the third act of Aida where I'm coming in and it's the Nile scene, the river, the Nile. And I'm coming up onto the stage and it's rehearsal. So I didn't see all of the things that were set before me, but I'm coming up onto the stage, a big, massive stage. And I'm about ready to sing and I look out over the desert and I saw a camel with three people leading two other little camels, somebody on the big camel, and I stopped. And my music went by. Maestro said, Mariana, what is wrong? <laughs> I couldn't sing. And I started to cry. I got so overwhelmed because I thought, my goodness, I said, Maestro, just give me one minute. I said, I looked out over the desert and I'm standing on hallowed ground. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm thinking what it must have been 2,000 years before me. Wow. And I had the opportunity to use the gift that God has given to me in that magnificent moment, what happened on that mount, mm -hmm. and all along that area. And I thought, thank you, God, mm. for giving me that opportunity. And I composed myself and went on. But it was a moment that I will never, ever forget. Because it was, maybe somebody else may not have thought of it that way but I, had, I didn't realize that they were bringing Aida on the camel, you know, up to the stage, but it, it stopped me dead in my tracks. Wow. So that's wow. one of those moments. There are many. Mm. Uh, I'll think about them for the next, when I see you in two weeks, but uh, that's one of the many, many blessings that God has, has given to me throughout oh, wow. my career. Thank you, thank you, Mary Ann. So welcome. Mm. Take care. Well, I hope you have plans to be here. Um, I already have friends that have reservations at the Quality Inn. They're coming to spend the night. Um, Reverend Alice Weaver Dunn and Reverend Keith Dunn will be here. Um, they can't wait to come hear you sing. So, All right. We're going to take a moment and kind of shift gears a little bit. We're going to hear um, some ministry of music. But first, we want to take a moment and recognize and thank some folks who have put a ton and when you get in Heritage Hall, you'll realize what I mean. A ton of work into this celebration. Um, if, if Judy and, and Lynn will stand, Lynn Black and Judy Schreffler um, are our history committee. There we go. There again, they stand on the shoulders of others who have done history in the past. And uh, they had some help putting some stuff up in the Heritage Hall. They had help from people like Rod Treffler and Marie Kozad and Amy Dick and Ann Bacher. But wait till you get in there and see the displays and the things you get to look at and the history of who we are as a church. And um, I'm sure you'll see some pictures that are familiar and you'll realize we do really stand on the shoulders of so many others. Isn't it nice that we, we have the, the privilege of being a part of a ministry that doesn't have to worry about a mortgage it doesn't have to worry about that kind of stuff because people before us have cared for that. And now we get the privilege of just doing ministry. And man, what fun it is, let me tell you. Um, so, thank you to the History Committee. Thank you to those who have prepared food. Some folks were here at 9 o'clock yesterday morning. When I was here at 2, they were, I don't know, maybe about halfway done. When I came in this morning, they were here. I don't think they spent the night. I don't know, but from the looks of the spread of food, they could have. So you will enjoy it. Sing for us, will you, Sam?
Thank you, choir. Thanks, Sam, Kim, and the team. If you have your Bibles with you, um, or if you want, grab one out of the pew rack in front of you and turn to the book of Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're going to look at uh, four short verses. Matthew 9, 14 to 17, all right? Here's what God's Word says. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So a lot of things have changed uh, in 152 years. Most people back in 1870 traveled by horse and buggy. There were very, very, very few cars. But some things never change. Train travel was available and growing in popularity in the post-Civil War America. Remember, this church is planted five years after the end of the Civil War. In 1871, there were 45,000 miles of track in existence. But in the next 29 years, they laid an additional 170,000 miles of track. Train travel was becoming the way to go. Boy, how things have changed, yes? But some things never change. In fact, steamboat travel was pretty popular. The first steamboat was invented in 1807, but the popularity really didn't grow until later in the 1800s. And traveling by steamboat was a wonderful way to get around. Boy, how things have changed. But you know what? Some things never change. In the 30 years from 1870 to 1900, 12 million people immigrated to the U.S., mostly from Germany, Ireland, and England. Created what's known as the tenements in New York. Cramped spaces where people, whole families were living in a single room. Boy, how things have changed, and yet some things never change. At the same time, many families were moving west with the expansion of the railroad. They were taking up new land out west and and starting to farm. But the odd thing is, a lot of rural America was simultaneously moving to the cities. About 11 million people relocated from rural America to urban America in 50 years from 1870 to 1920. Some things, though, never change. Parents made most of the children's toys that they played with, and rag dolls were really popular in 1870. In fact, some of the toys that they would get actually represented Bible stories. The purchased toys weren't real common in 1870. Public school attendance doubled in the 30 years from 1870 to 1900, but most children attended one-room schoolhouses. Oh, how things have changed. But some things never change. In 1865, slavery was declared illegal, the end of the Civil War. Here we have a a Native American and an African American gentleman. In 1870, African Americans were given the right to vote. Most couldn't, due to other laws that restricted voting. And for many African Americans, it wasn't until 1965, with the Voting Rights Act, that many of them were actually allowed and able to vote. Interestingly enough, so that's 1870, they were given the right to vote. 
when were women given the right to vote? 1920. Whoa, how things have changed. But some things never change. Bicycling here in Franklin's a big deal, you know. Steve Cole's headed down to the trail this morning at noon to, to kind of welcome people out of the salt box, and, and we love to bicycle our family. Bicycling started in 1870, became a craze in 1890. I don't know, Bill, those look tough to ride, don't they? Yeah, I don't, I, I'll stick with the one I got. Thank you very much. Oh, hell, things have changed. But some things have never changed. In 1870, families began to buy more and more commercial products, groceries and things like that, but they also began to order from catalogs. The first catalog was by a company known of as Montgomery Wards. Oh, how things have changed. <laughs> and yet, some things never change. Some other things. No refrigerators in 1870, no microwaves, no hair dryers. So all the children just went, are you kidding me? Here's the other thing. Only rarely, only rarely was there indoor plumbing. Much less multiple bathrooms in a single house. Penicillin was introduced in 1928. Prior to that, you know what they would give you? Heroin, cocaine, mercury. Lovely. Oh, how things have changed. Dating was not common, get this, until 1920. In the 1870s, it was most common your spouse was somebody your family had chosen, and you figured it out. Dating didn't exist. Oh, how things have changed. Social change has been a constant since 1870, amen? Some of those changes are for the better. Some of them we would contend are for the worse. You know, it used to be that all your relatives lived, you know, kind of within a stone's throw. And now they're scattered, scattered all over the country. Oh, how things have changed. But you know what? Some things never change, do they? In our text in Matthew, we hear this. Line. Neither do people pour new wines into old wine skins. If they do, the skins are burst. The wine will run out and the skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved. So let's look at this parable by Jesus. First of all, he's talking about wine and wine skins. So let me, let me share with you if you're not aware. Um, wine skins were most often made of the hide of an animal. Leather. They would sew up the openings, leave one opening open, and sometimes the neck of it was a small animal, or a foot if it was a larger animal, and they would tan that leather in a way, but the, the leather was elastic. It had some give. Because what does wine do as it ferments? <laughs> it creates pressure. And the new wineskin was able to move with that pressure and accommodate for it. But over time, the wineskins became hard, and brittle, and unable to give. If you put new wine in them and the wine began to expand and exert pressure, you had a catastrophe. What a mess. So in our parable, the wine is the kingdom of God. As Jesus tells this parable, he's alluding to the fact that the wine that he is talking about is the kingdom of the God, the kingdom of God. The folks around him knew of the kingdom of God of the Old Testament. The problem is they'd become pretty brittle. And this whole new way of doing things, they didn't have the flexibility to move with it. So if the old wineskins are Judaism, the new wineskins are Christianity. And let's be honest, the people of Jesus' day just didn't understand how this was all going to work they'd become pretty stiff in how they approached faith. Now, let's be clear. God's Word does not change. Our understanding of God's Word, that's a whole different story. When I was a child, I thought I understood God's Word really well in high school. 
And some passages I think I had a pretty good handle on, but as I grew in my faith, as I grew in years, as I grew in training, as I grew in experience, I began to see passages in a whole new light. The one story I always tell about that that probably is more indicative than any other was the day I was sitting in Greek class at Ohio University. And Dr. Steve Hayes, our professor, looked at Pete and I. There were about 12 people in class, but Pete and I were both headed to seminary. Pete had hair out to here. Pete was like a fur-bearing mammal. <laughs> Part, Pete was just, he just picked an indiscriminate line to stop shaving, but that dude was furry. He's still a pastor out in Ohio. And he says, Steve says, he says Pete, Daryl, this is the word. This is the word. And we're like, what, what, what word, Steve? And he says, you know that passage of scripture that talks about taking the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of your brother's or sister's eye? Pete and I both said yes. And he said, what's a log? And I went like this. No. That's not what this word means, he says. He said, this word in the text means the main beam that holds up the roof of a house. It's never shorter than 12 feet long, and it's usually about that big around. And that whole parable took on a whole new meaning. Because all of a sudden... For me to even get close enough to Karen to see the speck in her eye, I'd be smacking her upside the head with this log coming out of mine. I got to get the log out of my own eye before I can worry about picking specks out of my brother's eye, out of my sister's eye. And that whole text changed for me. I mean, I knew I was supposed to take the log out, but I didn't realize how serious God was until I learned something new about the text. So how do we apply this text to our lives? Here's some things I want to share with you. First of all, the wine, I think, for us is three things that are really the main thing in our lives. God, the gospel, and love. Three things that never change. Scripture says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. But aren't you glad that your understanding changes and you still don't have a fourth grade understanding of God or of life? My gosh, it was bad enough when I was 20. When I was four, it was a catastrophe. God does not change. The gospel does not change. The gospel is so clear. God loves you. God wants to forgive you of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ and call you into a relationship with him. There's nothing new under the sun about that. And love, whether it's the love of a parent for a child, a child for a parent, a spouse for their spouse, friends, that love does not change. Those are constants. Those are the main things. Now, the problem with any illustration is that you bump up against the edges of it. Because see, in wine... Wine ferments for a while and creates pressure, but then wine stops fermenting. I think what Jesus is talking about in both these parables is the fact that the main thing never stays static. It's always the same, but it is not static. So the wine is always fermenting, and the unshrunk cloth is always moving. So the old garment... The old wineskins either need to learn how to be flexible or they need to change. You see, the wineskins, or I'm calling it the delivery system, which is probably a really bad choice of words, but let's take these one at a time. When it comes to God's unchanging nature, you know, we, we can find all kinds of ways to worship God. You've experienced this morning in the last 58 minutes Traditional worship, blended worship, and contemporary worship all at the same time. Isn't that cool? Some of you love those old hymns, and you feel so bad when we don't sing them. And some of you are like, I didn't even know those songs. Because I only come to 9.35 and 11, and I've never heard some of them. And some of you that always come to 8.15 and love the traditional music haven't heard some of the new stuff we sing, maybe. But God is big enough to allow us to sing in whatever style we like. The point is we're to worship God. How we worship him 
He doesn't get picky about it. And let's be honest, over the time of Scripture, worship of God has changed. Anybody really want to go back to the sacrificial system? No. No, I'm, I'd be out. I'd be a no-go for me. I'd go back to doing photography or something. Our worship styles can change. They can be flexible. But God never changes. Yes, you can worship God out in nature, but there's nothing like being here. Oh, my gosh. Last week was off the hook. I shared with Mary Ann briefly that um, we, we're back to pre-pandemic numbers for the first time since March of 2020. We had 480-some people through the door last week. That's like, blew me away. I saw people I haven't seen in months. I saw people I didn't know, which is really cool. So worship can change, but God stays the same. The gospel does not change, but how we deliver that to people, there's not just one way. It's one thing to come up to someone and share the four spiritual laws or share Romans Road or, or share some scripture that tells them about how God loves them and wants to have a relationship with them. But you know what? Sometimes you've got you to plow some ground first before you plant seed. And so this church is getting really good at finding ways to connect with the community to plow the ground first through our servant evangelism. Whether it's a drive through dinner whether it's caring for people to walk through our doors every week and ask for help, whether it's all kind of ways we have to reach out to people through funeral dinners. You notice we eat a lot in this church. Wow. <laughs> Just saying, we are definitely Methodists. There's all kinds of ways to share the gospel. There's all kinds of ways to do ministry. I don't think most of us would be really content going back to Amy Smith Hall and, and hearing her children's lessons because we've grown past that. But you know what? If you're younger than sixth grade, that's exactly what you need. We have all these adult Sunday school classes, and they're wonderful, and they have an opportunity to share the gospel with, with folks that come into the class. But you know what? We wouldn't want to stick fourth graders in there. That wouldn't work. The gospel does not ever change how we deliver it man the pandemic if it taught us anything it taught us that we can deliver it in all kinds of ways we never imagined i never thought i would have to stand here and preach to an empty room for weeks on end and just hope that you guys were out there watching but that's what we had to do and fortunately we had the capability of doing that and love never changes. I don't know about you, but when Sharon and I first met, I know you're going to find this really hard to believe, but I had issues. <laughs> Not that I don't have any now, let's be clear about that. But I was like two and a half years out of a divorce. I was angry. I was bitter. I was trying to manage two boys that were a little out of the box. They were uh, young at the time, seven and nine, I believe. And yet she put up with me for these 24 years. You know, I love her different now than I loved her then. And I express that love different now than I did then. I, I hope that, that, that whether it's a spouse or a child or a friend or a parent that you constantly find new ways to tell them that you love them. That you constantly find new ways to express your care and your concern. One of the things that Sharon and I enjoy doing is, is hiking and going for walks. And, and some of those are some of our favorite memories from vacations. Especially the day we about got blown off the mountain in the Great Smokies. We were up at Klingman's Dome and storms were rolling in. And, and she said... If we die on this mountain, I'm going to really be ticked. And I said, honey, you cannot be that fortunate. You're going to have to walk the whole way back to the van. <laughs> we made it back. We were wet. But, you know, we created fun memories. That's one of the things we do together as a couple. 
It's one of the ways we show love. What about your children? You know, when, when kids are little, they need one style of love. But boy, when they get older, you got to love them different. Love doesn't change, but how you share it with them, how you speak into them, how you encourage them, changes radically. And let's be honest, when they get to be teenagers, it gets way more complex, doesn't it? Yeah. I appreciate that. Some things never change. In 152 years... This church has been really about a couple of things. It's been about worship, growing in our faith, and sharing that faith with others. If you go back and look at some of the history, there was a point in in history of this church where they expanded the church, not because it didn't have any room in the sanctuary, but because they needed more education space to teach people how to have a deeper walk with Christ. That's incredible. I can't imagine what it would have been like For this congregation to decide to launch 152 years ago. Five years after the Civil War, Franklin's starting to grow. There are other churches popping up. And this church begins. It began over town a little ways, but it wasn't long before it hit this piece of property. And we have over 150 years of doing ministry on this piece of ground. I hope you appreciate the shoulders you stand on. There have been people praying for ministry in Franklin on this piece of property for over 150 years. And for 150 years, they've been doing their level best to listen to God and to make that happen. See, that's the part I don't want to change. I want to keep listening to God and keep making ministry happen. Now, we may have to add some technology Can you imagine if you said to them in the 1900s, we need to hire a tech director. (laughs) We need a what? We need an outreach coordinator. A what? But you know what? There are all kinds of ways that we're doing ministry today that just blow me away and really weren't even on my radar when I was in seminary. And we just keep doing it. Inviting people to come in for an if gathering for women and hosting it so that that ladies from churches that are so small that they can't do that can come here and learn about what God's calling them to next. Gathering up youth and floating them down the creek in kayaks just so they can have some fun and learn to rely on each other. I shouldn't tell you this because some of you don't know it, but we own a lot of Nerf guns in this church. Because one of the things that the youth love to do is have Nerf battles. It's funny, one, one, one day I, I was talking to an individual and their son came in and said, I just got a new Nerf gun. I said, well, where is it? He said, hot in the car. Mom said, I'm not allowed to bring it into church. And I said, come with me. <laughs> Took him down, said to the car. He goes, you got Nerf guns? I said, yeah. And when you get in seventh grade, you can be a part of the youth group and you can play with him. All right. He was so excited. I think I've got him hooked. Nerf guns. Yep. All kinds of ways to reach out and connect with people so they belong. So that now it's safe to believe. To believe there is a God someplace that loves me. There's a God that knows me by name. There's a God that knows everything about me and every word before it comes out of my mouth. That's mind-boggling. But that's the God we serve. That's the God that's preserved this congregation for 150 years and isn't done yet. And I can't wait to see what he's going to do next as we continue to do ministry day in and day out. Sam's going to come and share with us a song, and and let me preface it by saying this. Um, This is a song that none of you have ever heard. Kim's heard it. Sam just wrote it. Like, not since church started. Don't get... He's good, but he's not that good, okay? <laughs> he wrote it, um, and they, they were still tweaking it this week as we were um, getting ready to come to worship. They were, uh, they were tweaking it over the weekend. So he's going to come and share that with us, and then we'll, uh, we'll pray before we move on, all right?
Today we celebrate a century and a half when those first few faithful gathered with no pastor, no staff. From that small group her first met in Hunter's little tin shop came a vision that would be a church with a passion nothing could stop. We are his church. We are his pioneers. It was many years ago God brought us here. Here to be a voice. Here to make a place to offer hope found in God's redeeming grace. Here to be the gospel and here to be his light. Here to care for others. Here to be Christ. Through the years came many changes. Six buildings up till now. A growing congregation yet only going where grace would allow. Five or more generations, saints gone above and saints still here, yet unchanged is still the message of Christ's salvation to all made clear. We are his church. Oh, we are his pioneers. It was many years ago God brought us here. must now gaze on tomorrow instead. For if the church which we call home is to remain until the end, we must devote our lives and families to a faith we will do. God and 
Thank you, Sam. Why don't you stay standing a minute and we'll pray together. Father God, we want to be your church. Not just to gather to worship, Father, but we want to be your church mobilized, making a difference, calling people who don't know you into a relationship with you, inspiring those who have trusted in you to grow deeper in their faith. Father, we want to be the hands and feet of Christ. Empower us to do so. Because, Father, that is what we're all about, and that never, ever changes. We ask all this, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Can we stand and sing? Stay standing.
You can be seated. You can be seated. Well, I guess we have one point of agreement, and that is we have a great God. Amen? Amen. We've celebrated today his greatness. We've celebrated his faithfulness. And now's an opportunity to celebrate his goodness with uh, these gifts of uh, tithes and offerings. Daryl has reminded you once or twice already. I'm going to remind you once, and he'll probably remind you again. Pastor David Holstey, you used to tell us you had to tell people seven times, I believe. (laughs) So maybe we can fit three more in, but what I wanted to remind you is stop into Heritage Hall. Enjoy some fellowship, some food, and look at the pictures all around. A special thanks to Tracy Burkhart and Terry Ann Russell for helping put all of those together. We thank you. And now let's offer our thanks to God. He has blessed us, so our gifts today are to return our thanks back to Him. Let us pray. God, you have been good, and we offer these gifts to you as really just a a small token. Lord, we could never uh, outgive you, but Lord, we offer these as our expression of gratitude. Lord, thank you for bringing us to this place, to this time, to this space in the world that you've created. And Lord, we uh, just honor you now, and we trust you. And we give our gifts as a token of that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. stand and sing our praise. quick announcements before we head out. Um, First of all, you're going to go into the Heritage Hall because every family is going to get a coin that has a picture of our church on one side with the dates and on the back, a lamp, owing to our oil heritage and to the light of Christ with our mission statement around it. And there's also a book in there of history information you're going to want to pick up. So if you uh, 
the door going out towards the parking lot of Heritage Hall is where those folks will be located, passing that stuff out. They'll check off your family name and give you what you need. Um, there is a drive-up dinner this week, Wednesday. Now remember, what's Ann doing on Monday? Knee surgery. Knee surgery. Guess where she won't be on Wednesday? Yeah. There you go. If you can help out, come along. Kingdom Bond Kids Club is this week, Thursday night. So see Amy about information on that, Amy Smith. We're looking for 50 dozen homemade cookies. Well, cookies. They don't have to be homemade. For a reception on May 6th. What's that all about, Marianne? Oh, I guess you and I are getting cookies, girl. That's good. Good. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> okay. And lastly, Vacation Bible School is set June 20 to 24. So um, we're looking for volunteers. You can see Amy Smith about that as well, all right? Let's stand and sing. Peace. May the peace of Christ go with you this day in Jesus' name. Amen.